And the same thing is true when it comes to our faith. Faith is a muscle that you have to use. You must use it. It is not enough to just listen to a sermon on a Sunday or listening to a Bible teaching all day long. Hearing alone is not enough to develop your faith. You must use your faith muscle and you must fight to simply keep it. And I'll say fight the good fight. That is what it's essentially all about. Mm -hmm. Quickly, I want you to think, and I say quickly, just not too much in your head, but when you hear the word faith, like what comes to mind? Like what's faith to you? And I don't necessarily need you to answer, but I want you to process it in your head. The importance of both, the proper diet of God's word and exercising our faith is we'll naturally see it grow. Most Christians, I would hope, or most believers, most followers of the way, us in this room, if we think about this word, I hope we just think about God's word, but what it says faith simply is. Where it says faith is, right, the substance of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So I want you to think just briefly, what's happening in your core that's maybe you hope for? You haven't seen it happen yet. Do you have faith that it's even possible? Do you have faith, as an individual, as a local officer, do you have faith that I think we can fill up every chair in this room? I know you heard it a little bit last night. You'll hear it right now. But like, this is the most people we've had in D.C. for over 20 years. And depending on who you talk to, some people will be like, I never heard of D.C. It's some people who are here this weekend, over there, why are you in uniform? <laughs> What's D.C.? So it's some people at our course, right, who don't even know what it is. And some people might know what it is, but don't care to know. And I say that because sometimes I've been at cores, I've led in a core, had the privilege of leading for Carlos for a decent amount of years in Port Charlotte, where you would make announcements time and time again. Well, nobody told me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been saying it every Sunday. <laughs> like, what do you mean? You wasn't listening or nobody told you? It's, it's okay if you wasn't listening. But I believe that scripture is pretty clear on what faith is. When the answer to your prayers is not on the horizon, when you don't feel differently, you need to fight the good fight and say, you know what? God's word says it, and that's all the evidence that I need. It is the evidence of the things not seen, and I'm going to stand on that truth and that truth alone. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what circumstances say. I don't care what others say. I am going to fight the good fight of the substance of the things hoped for, the evidence of what I do not see. And you stay with it until, as they say, faith, right, turns into sight. Mm -hmm. Where because of that building and that growing of your faith, you're going to see not only just the works of maybe the labors of those whose shoulders you stand on today, but the work of your labor. And for some of us, right, you might not see it. But because of the work that you put in, the person who comes after you, they might, in the, in the best way, be blessed with those riches. Um, and because I always have to say this, just so people know that it doesn't always happen by just a person being in a place. But I think of Jasenia, she's with two of my favorite people right now, retired officers, Major Maria and Ale um, Maria Elena and Moises Hernandez. And Carlos was <coughs> in Port Charlotte with us, yeah. where we'll have about 70 to 80 or so kids. Mm -hmm. But I would credit anywhere between five or 10 of those kids was already there when I got there. And then the other 50 or 60 came from um, these retired officers who poured into the Hispanic community. Um, I tried at times, because kids who probably came through for Christmas um, angel tree assistance or just social services and making attempts and then language barriers being a hard time. And then we got an influx of, you know, for me, it was easy to get to the Haitian or the Creole speaking individuals part of our core. And then talking to some of the parents of angling how I ask certain questions. I'm like, hey, are you interested in your kid learning how to play the piano? Are you interested in learning your, your child and learning how to play an instrument? And most parents will naturally say, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially when you start telling them, free, free, free. <laughs> <laughs> that free make a big difference for a lot of people. But through those conversations, it led to having a conversation with these retired officers. Who I just had to sit down with them and be like, man, we got a long list of kids who we brag about every year. Mm -hmm. Hey, we gave away 500 backpacks. Hey, we served 800 kids. Not to be in the best way judgmental or prejudiced or looking at certain things, but I'm like, when I start seeing these Rosales or Martinez or like these names, I'm like, I know these are Hispanic speaking, Spanish speaking families. 
are you willing to just help communicate that we have programs for them? We can call, we can make house visits, we can do whatever you feel is better. Because you're, in the best way, I went to these retirement homes and I said, I just need your help. Because I know I can't do it alone. And literally, you're talking about in a span of two to three weeks, from like we started in like a January, well, we started like a January, late January, early February, we did, which at the time was crazy that we was even thinking, but we did two VBS that year. One in March for spring break, we brought a whole bunch of kids, and then we did another one um, in August, part of our back to school batch. And you're talking about on a consistent basis, every Tuesday, 70 or 80 kids walking through our doors. Yes. On days when we went crazy, like 120, 130. And you're talking about facilities with no gym, where we were hassling to get a pavilion with our local community, and I'm talking about our civic leadership, and also with DHQ. And it was like a hassle. And I'm just like, we don't have the space inside of these four or five classrooms in a fellowship hall that's a little bit bigger than this room that we're in. I'm like, we need some type of help. Like, y'all don't want to give us a gym, at least give us a pavilion. And the part that frustrated me at the time was being someone who sits on core council, being someone who worked at the core, being someone who knew the finance of the core. I'm like, we can afford it. And not just build it, we could run it. Mm -hmm. Port Charlotte is a blessed place, and they are. They're good. They got it. There you go. <laughs> but it was one of those places, and as God was working, it was simply by faith of like, let's just go off on a ledge. Kids might say no, families might say no, but like, if you don't try, you're never going to know. That's right. <coughs> they definitely might say yes, and a lot of these families um, did. Yes. I want you to think simply of. Maybe, what are, you, what are you struggling with? And when you think about what you're struggling with at times, I would say that for some people, not everybody, for some people, faith comes, and I'll say real faith, I'm not saying just like, ah, oh, that faith, yeah, it's not really, I don't say it anymore. But that real faith comes sometimes from just standing in that storm. And I would encourage you, if you're already here, if you're already part of it, just run the race. Run the race. Right? Scripture simply tells us that, right, um, in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, we are also since, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily traps us, and let us run with endurance that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of of the throne of God. Amen. So you have a Savior who not only <laughs> had faith that, like, think about that, like, just a little bit. I know we know the gospel story. We know what Jesus did. Like, I am going to leave paradise mm. to go to this mess yeah. mm, to help people because the faith that I have in my God. Yeah. And these people are not going to like me. These people ain't going to care about me. These people are going to ridicule me. These people are going to kill me. <laughs> And the most, I'm not saying we can't get persecuted here in the States, but that's not really a common fear in a lot of our churches. Like, the most you're going to get, well, they don't like me. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like Jesus to the point they killed him. Like, you'll be all right. <laughs> and sometimes, yes, you might ruffle some feathers, but I believe if you're leading with your heart, and if Jesus is there, if you're leading with that spirit, with that faith that God has led you, I would say, and I say this to everybody and every person that I can, never, never compromise your relationship with God for the sake of man. Amen. That's right. Never compromise your relationship with God for the sake of man. Man can't save you. That's right. That's right. God can and God does. Yes. Jesus is essentially like our, what I would say, our weight trainer. He leads us, and he is our, in the best way, the best coach that you can have. You might have that friend, that family member who you call on, and you're going through something, you're like, hey, I'm going through this, and it's like, okay. And sometimes you can know some of your friends by how they lead you in certain conversations, <clears throat> right? And if you don't, I would encourage you to start thinking about some of the stuff that you call your friends for. Um, and I'll just pick on one of my friends because he's in here, so it's easier to talk about people in front of them and not behind their back. <laughs> but I think about Bronte. So me, Bronte, a friend named Tim, and a friend named JP, we literally talk just about what well, we text every day. Um, we try our best to talk at least once every two weeks where we get back on a group FaceTime and have some real hard checkups. 
All four of us are married men. Three, one is an officer, two are soldiers in our respective corps. One um, leads at a praise and worship at a local church in Tallahassee. But we have conversations with like, how's your marriage? What are you struggling with? For him and JP, what is parenting like? What is your challenges? What sin are you struggling with this week? How can we pray for you? And we have those moments where it comes from long conversations that is like, I can't believe we just talked for three hours. <laughs> it comes from tears on the phone, or like, bro, you good? Or some of us, we hold so much in, and we're not even transparent with those who God has called us to live life with. Mm -hmm. And God already knows and sees all of that. So if God has called someone to be in your life, whether that be your spouse, whether that be a, and I say a double child, because you're probably not telling your 13, 14 year old child everything that you're dealing with. Um, but maybe it's an adult child who you can have those hard conversations with. Maybe it's somebody in your court. Maybe it's your officer. Maybe it's a local church down the road who you know one of your friends go to that church and you're like, I need to get this off my chest because I don't need this weight or this burden on me. And I believe that if many people who are serious about working, or working out, some of them will have either that discipline or they'll have a personal trainer who will work with them to be more effective for them to be more effective. And for us, we have the greatest trainer in our life, and that his name is Jesus. Yes. Earlier you heard Major saying, imitate me, imitate Jesus, imitate God. For the past 70 years, seven, seven or so years, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bonte, but we got to do what, 2015, 2016 area? 2015, and it just says PPB, which is this little group of friends who's just positive vibe boys, but the scripture that's on here is 1 Corinthians 11. 1. I didn't know what he was gonna talk about. He didn't know what I was talking about. We just gave up title of discipleship, faith building. But on here, right, that scripture, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, is imitate me as I imitate Christ. Mm -hmm. Or follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And that has been my life verse even prior to wearing this. But it's always one of those things, like how am I conscious about the way that I live my life in person, on social media, around my family, around my friends, in the midst of peers, in the midst of strangers, where people who could follow my example, am I leading them to Christ? Or am I one way at the court, dress up all nice with the uniform, da 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 da, and then when I'm at home, it's a different me. I just want you to not live that way because God sees all of that. Um, I have a brief video for you, hopefully in words. championship post Shaq. If you know Shaq, him and Shaq won three championships together, then they lost the fourth time. They had a crazy feud. Shaq goes to Miami, won another championship, and they still continue some of their feud of like, I won without Kobe, and y'all saying it was Kobe because of me. Kobe knew that because of previous series, right, that we can't just let our guards down. Because once we let our guards down, that's when we as a team falter. That's when we fail. That's when we don't, in the best way, perform our best. Now this was also, right, because um, they ended up beating Orlando, but they up 2-0 in the series. If you know basketball or most major sports, it's the first one to four, winning four games, you win, you win the championship in the way. Whether it's Stanley Cup, whether it's, well I guess everything but the Super Bowl, because Super Bowl is just winning. <laughs> just win that one game and you're good. But basketball and for hockey and baseball, just about all the other sports, outside of football, I'm sorry. Um, it's four games and then you're good. You're halfway there. And you hear the reporter, you're halfway there, no smile. Because see, Kobe knew that that wasn't the goal, to win two games. 
right? The goal was to essentially win the championship. Mm -hmm. But see, the difference between us and Kobe in this context is, hopefully, you know the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We win. God has already told us that the victory is ours. But sometimes we go through life with no faith as if we're already losing or as we're going to lose. And I would just encourage you to have faith that there's no reason for you to live that way. And one of the reasons you shouldn't live that way is because you have a God who simply cares about you. Like there's some people who sometimes we care about them and they don't care about us. And I say that in a way of like, you'll do everything like you'll exhaust yourself time and time again. Whether it's for a friend, whether it's for a family member, whether it's for a stranger, whether it's for somebody in the church. Maybe it's even at your core. Of like, I do everything for them and they're not doing anything for me. And not saying in a way of you're doing it with hopes of a reciprocation type of thing, right? Like, well, I did this. But like, well, what else do you want me to do? Like, you gave me a laundry list of things and I've done all of that. And now you're telling me you want more. But that is not how God treats us. Mark 4, right? Mark chapter 4, verses 37 through 40. It says, In a great windstorm, and you know these stories, right? In a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, sea Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So the first level of faith that Jesus speaks about is no faith. No faith believes God does not care and is characterized by the disciples who woke Jesus in the midst of the storm and said, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? Perhaps you are in a storm and it's to you, perhaps you're, you are in a storm and to you it seems like God is simply asleep and that he doesn't even care, that he is aloof, disinterested, and disconnected from you, that you are going through hell in the best way and he doesn't care. 